Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless we now live in an isaiah 520 world where evil is good and good is evil where the sin of being a homosexual or transgender is openly celebrated and even glorified one of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of homosexuality that is sweeping the world today Jesus said he would return at a time when society parallels the days of Lot, as we read in Luke 17, 28 through 30. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. To find out what parallels our days with the days of Lot, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 19, 1 through 5. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. The term know them isn't a friendly handshake and how are you. It is to know them in a sexual way. What parallels our days with the days of Lot is homosexuality. Just as in the days of Lot, not only is homosexuality widely accepted today, but it's being taught to our kids just like in Sodom, as we read in verse 4. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. There are many people within the church who are teaching that homosexuality is not a sin, when scripture clearly says it is. This is another sign Jesus gave to look for prior to his second coming, as we read in Matthew 24, 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God.
Joining me now, the young woman you just saw, Peyton McNabb, a North Carolina high school athlete, and Riley Gaines, former swimmer at the University of Kentucky. Both are IWF spokeswomen. Uh, Peyton, why did you feel that it was important to speak out now? Um, well, I figured if not now, then when. Um, you know, this is something that is definitely really important, and um, it needs to it needs to come to an end. How long did you? play volleyball before the incident in question? How many years have you been playing? So I started in middle school, so I've been playing for seven years before the incident. And if biological boys or young men are allowed to play in girls volleyball or women's volleyball, how long do you think women like you or young women like you will choose to play given the dangers at hand? Um, it, <laughs> I really don't think that girls will want to play. I mean, the fear of that happening, of what happened to me happening to them, I feel like that will definitely um, stop some girls and women from participating in sports if this is continued to now, um, be Riley, allowed. Yeah, I mean, Riley, the Biden administration proposed th these new Title IX rules that would bar federally funded schools from banning these trans athletes. So here's your former competitor, and another man, Leah Thomas, and his reaction. It is not enough. During this time of intense anti-trans backlash, the trans community needs explicit protections from discrimination in order to live our lives freely and equally. All trans kids deserve the opportunity to compete and play in the sports they love without compromising who they are. Riley, your reaction to that? If you watch this full video, I think it's about a minute and a half long, um, Thomas says things like, it breaks my heart to see trans, trans women and trans girls lose out on opportunities. Everywhere in this dialogue where, where Thomas says the word trans women, you could replace this word with women and girls, and that's exactly what we are seeing. We're seeing women and girls lose out on opportunities. So for Thomas to come out and, and basically say, you know, this is what makes us happy. Um, this is, this is, it's good for our mental health. They're denying what this actually is for women and girls. It's the same thing we just saw from this representative who goes on to say, you know, um, we're doing this for, for all of our youth and all of our, every American. But again, they're doing this in the, in the guise of being inclusive, but what it really is is exclusive. It's exclusive to women and girls, um, and it, per, it permits something like what happened to Peyton to happen to any girl. Um, and they're denying that it's happening, and what they're really doing is, is saying they don't care that if it does happen. Well, Peyton, you said this can con continue to happen, uh, injuries, uh, as you suffered a, co a severe concussion. But let's, say, let's take it a step further. Let's talk about other sports that involve, you know, more, you know, violent interactions, like girls lacrosse. Uh, girls basketball. Does that mean the WNBA should be open to male basketball players? I'd love to, you know, have Megan Rapinoe when she was playing on the field against, you know, any, you know, decent uh, college athlete, male athlete, who happened to be a, a, you know, a young man when he was playing college uh, soccer, but decided, you know, he was going to make a transition. None of this ends up working in practice. It just doesn't work. No, it doesn't. It's um, to think of, let's think of someone like LeBron James playing on a WNBA team. I mean, that's, that, thought is, <laughs> that thought is comical, right? And that's exactly what this is. It's, it's, it's a mockery. It's almost funny what's happening. You see posts from the Babylon Bee. Um, you see DeSantis' ad where he had, um, it was this big satire. But in reality, it's supposed to be satire. But it, it's, again, it's actually happening. We had kind of a kind of a, a long distance shot from when you were hit uh, by that spike. Um, but that was brutal. I mean, I don't know how hard that hit your face, but how long the pain went on from that. But again, that's a ball hitting you. Imagine if it's an elbow or, you know, a, you know, a shove or a lacrosse stick. What then? That's really um, the whole the whole fear of that. I know it would be um, it would be really devastating for what happened to me to become the norm, and that's why I feel I almost feel um, scared of how many times this is going to have to happen before people see the issue with it.
Yeah, how many young girls and young women are going to have to suffer before uh, all of America wakes up to this? Romans 1, 18 through 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans chapter 1 tells us God has revealed to mankind that He is the Creator of all things, and that He has made it known to mankind that they are without excuse through His creation that He exists. God demands that we worship Him and recognize Him as the Creator. And when a society does not glorify Him as God, He gives them up to three phases of judgment. Romans 1 verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts. The first phase of judgment is an impure heart. The second phase of judgment is of the body, verses 26 and 27. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. The third phase of judgment is in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to do those things which are not fitting. First, the heart is rotten, then the body follows, and then the mind goes. The moral law of God written on the heart has literally been stomped out and replaced with cultural immorality. Immorality now goes in every direction. The mind is corrupt. People don't think right. They advocate all the wretched things and depreciate all the virtuous things. And what flows out of this pornographic, homosexual, depraved culture? All evil, verses 29 through 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. It is evident by looking at society that we are in the third and final judgment on America. In these last days, society has not retained God in their knowledge, and in return, God has given them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. The phrase debased mind is found in Romans 128 in reference to those whom God has rejected as godless and wicked. The Greek word translated debased is a dokimos, which means unacceptable, that is, rejected, by implication, worthless. In Titus 1.16, the Apostle Paul refers to those whose works are debased. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. People who are classified as having a debased mind have some knowledge of God and perhaps know of His commandments, but they live impure lives and have no desire to please God. Those who have debased minds lived corrupt and selfish lives, and sin is justified and acceptable to them. The debased are those whom God has rejected and is left to their own devices. Can a Christian have a debased mind? Someone who has sincerely accepted Jesus Christ by faith will not have this mindset, because the old person with a debased mind has been reborn into a new creation, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Christians are basically new people. We live differently and speak differently. Our world is centered on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christians have the Holy Spirit to help us live a God-honoring life, as we read in John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance 
all things that I said to you. Those with debased minds do not have the Spirit and live only for themselves. Christians have been given the Spirit of God as a gift, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 12-16. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, speaking of the unsaved, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Psalm 107, 33 and 34 He turns rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Dry mud covered in salt, as far as the eye can see. Lake Popo was once the second largest body of water in Bolivia. A descendant of the indigenous Uru people, Erasmo saw the lake slowly dry up over the past 20 years. The water didn't come back because of the lack of rain. Our ancestors used to say that the lake came back every 10 years, but so far, it's still gone. Lake Popo has been through many droughts, but this one is longer and more sudden. As you can see, since the water disappeared, everything has been abandoned. Uru families can't fish anymore. Before the lake went dry, water demand in the region increased drastically, mainly because of galloping urbanization, quinoa cultivation, and mining. Things got worse after El Nino brought severe droughts. The Uru Murato people were among the most impacted. Women couldn't fish anymore and moved towards arts and crafts. We do this to survive, to be able to put food on the table. But we don't make much money. Sometimes we sell a little and sometimes not at all. It used to be beautiful out on the lake with 38 bird species. We had so much to eat, but now there's nothing left. Men are leaving to work in the mines. The village lost half its population in nearly 10 years. There are only 88 of them left. In La Paz, the drought is being monitored by the Bolivian Hydro Meteorological Bureau. These past years, we've seen rather high temperatures, way over the historical records. This phenomenon leads to evaporation, too. Because of global warming and failing water management policies, Lake Popo is unlikely to recover anytime soon. Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Another day under a hot sun. But people here hope the temperatures won't be as high as previous days. It's those in rural parts of central India who are the most vulnerable. A lack of electricity and water infrastructure means they have little respite from heat waves. Water is a big issue. I feel extremely hot. My hands and legs are always aching. There's this issue of power cuts. Because of this heat, there are power cuts all the time. These are the problems I've been facing. In some villages, there is no running water. People rely on wells for their supply and those in several villages complain of water shortages. In others, entire families, including children, have to work. During the summer months, bricks dry faster, but working in the summer carries risks. The sun is too harsh. We face a lot of difficulty. Our children fall sick all the time. Sometimes we also fall sick. But what to do? 
It's the only work we have, otherwise there's no other source of employment. Ram's wife has been sick for two days with heat stroke. He can't afford to stop working. It's estimated that 49% of the Indian workforce work outdoors. The heat waves are placing an unprecedented burden on public health, agriculture and other systems. Some believe India's government is underestimating the impact of heat waves induced by climate change. India has a climate vulnerability index through which it assesses its vulnerability to the climate crisis and works within that framework. The UN and climate scientists are warning heat waves will be more common and the Indian government is likely to come under growing pressure to update its policies to protect the most vulnerable. The state of the global climate is alarming, to say the least. That's according to a report by the UN's WMO. It says people on every continent are being affected after many records linked to climate change were broken last year. They included those on rainfall in Pakistan, heat waves in China and Europe, and ocean temperatures also reached record highs, with nearly 60% suffering at least one marine heat wave. The report says trying to save the glaciers is a lost cause underlying the irreversible nature of climate trends on our planet. A year of extremes. The UN says 2022 saw sea levels and ocean heat reach record levels. And it described those for the melting of some glaciers in Europe as off the charts. In its annual global climate report, the World Meteorological Organization says Antarctic sea ice fell to its lowest extent ever recorded adds to a final warning last month issued by the UN's climate body, the IPCC, that time is running out for the world. In Europe, the report says at least 15,000 people died last year due to intense heat waves. And in Africa, more than 1.7 million people in Somalia and Ethiopia were displaced from their homes by drought. At the other extreme, flooding devastated Pakistan, leaving about a third of the nation submerged and 8 million people displaced. The report also warns more extreme weather could be seen as soon as next year if no action is taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We need accelerated action in three areas. First, net zero deadlines. My proposal is for leaders of developed countries to commit to reaching net zero as close as possible to 2040, the limit you should all aim to respect. And for leaders of emerging economies to commit to reaching net zero as close as possible to 2050. The developing world is suffering disproportionately from climate disasters. And so far, only a few nations are on track to meet their climate goals. And according to the UN, to avert disaster, nations must adapt quickly to a warming planet or it'll be too late. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather. And yet it was foretold 2000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. 
Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. An attack at dawn, sending many people in the city of Savare from their sleep into a panic. These explosions are part of what Mali's military say was a sophisticated attack on the main airport in the region of Mopti. A suicide car bomb was used in the assault, but shells also landed on people's homes in the city center. People here tried to pull out survivors from under the rubble. The man filming on his cell phone says 20 people from one family were trapped here. All are dead now. After several hours of heavy fighting, UN peacekeeping soldiers from Senegal repelled the attackers trying to capture the airport. Shells landed on a camp housing Russian fighters from the Wagner Group. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack, but it has the hallmarks of armed groups linked to ISIL that are active in the region and to the Al-Qaeda affiliate Jamaat Nusrat al-Islam al-Muslimin, also known as Jinnim. Everything is pointing toward uh, the Jinnim group because this is the type of a uh, um, attack they would do um, and they have been uh, clear over the past few months that uh, they will not tolerate uh, the presence of Russians uh, among the Malians. The military says its troops are combing the city looking for enemy combatants. But some people are taking justice into their own hands. This man is a suspected attacker and appears to have his hands and feet tied. They ask him, where are you fleeing? Where are the others? This was supposed to be a day for people to celebrate the Muslim festivities of Eid. Instead, it's a day of bloodshed. The governor of Sivara says blood donations are needed urgently. Hospitals are overwhelmed by casualties. And the people of Sivare are trying to make sense of the violence and continuing to look for survivors under the rubble. Overseas now growing concern tonight for thousands of Americans and U.S. Embassy personnel trapped by the fighting in Sudan. U.S. forces are in the region standing by to assist with possible evacuations. Both warring generals have agreed to a three-day ceasefire, but their guns have not fallen silent. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Tonight, a fragile ceasefire reached in Sudan after a week of intense fighting that has left at least 400 people dead. The two rival military groups saying they have agreed to a 72-hour truce to allow humanitarian aid to enter the country and to celebrate the end of Ramadan. But with gunfire continuing in the capital of Khartoum, even after the announcement, there's growing concern over the safety of the estimated 16,000 Americans currently inside Sudan, including roughly 70 U.S. embassy personnel sheltering in place. The main airport damaged, closed indefinitely. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin confirming today U.S. forces have now deployed to the region to assist with the possible evacuation of embassy workers. We always want to make sure that we're doing prudent planning, which is what we're doing. We've deployed some forces uh, into theater to ensure that uh, we provide as many options as possible. The State Department adding that it's been in contact with hundreds of private American citizens inside Sudan to provide support. With the White House emphasized today that it is not standard procedure to evacuate Americans living abroad. So those 16,000 Americans currently in Sudan who are not embassy workers, they cannot rely on military assistance to evacuate. We turn now to the war in Ukraine and a new round of Western tanks on their way to the battlefield. Spain says six of its German-made Leopard tanks will arrive soon. This comes as the U.S. prepares to start training Ukrainian forces on American Abrams tanks next month. ABC's chief foreign correspondent, Ian panel in Kharkiv tonight. Tonight, Ukraine eagerly awaiting more modern tanks as it prepares for a spring counteroffensive against invading Russian forces. Spain on Friday sending six Leopard 2 tanks with four more to follow. And the U.S. announcing a major push to train Ukrainian troops on American tanks. 31 M1 Abrams are headed for Germany next month to train Ukrainian crews. Ukraine arguing time's running out in its efforts to counter a more powerful Russian army that's nonetheless making few gains. The Russians lack in leadership, they lack will, the morale is poor, and their discipline is eroding. Russian officials even admitting they accidentally bombed one of their own cities Thursday. Russia has air superiority, but Ukraine refusing to see the skies. This is the only American-made Black Hawk helicopter in the entire Ukrainian armed forces. They're desperate for more. Currently, they're flying old Soviet machines 
They say this is much more advanced and gives them much more capability. The pilot, Corsign Maestro, has been flying constant missions since the war began. Not asking for the human resources. We are ready to buy these kind of the helicopters. So it's easy. Where the tanks and new ammunition are going to be a huge boost for Ukraine, but if a planned spring counteroffensive is going to work, they'll need all the help they can get. So we spent last week talking a lot about the leaker, the 21-year-old Massachusetts Air National Guardsman, who brought forward documents proving the Biden administration has been lying about the war in Ukraine for more than a year. Now we know that there are, in fact, boots on the ground, American special forces fighting in Ukraine. We also know that Ukraine is losing that war. Most media outlets are telling you the opposite. They're telling you, in fact, to focus on the leaker, not what he leaked. But Senator Mike Braun of Indiana is one of the very few Republicans in the Senate who is concerned about the substance of this story. What do these documents reveal and how should we respond? Thank you so much for coming on and for paying yeah. attention to what matters, not the kid, but what he showed us. What do you think these documents say and how should we respond to them? Yeah, we've been engaged over there for over a year and all you heard was transparency and we will not have troops on the ground. Sadly, you get the information like this. Just a few days ago, we sent off a letter, tell us who authorized this, how many are actually there, what are they doing? This is eerily familiar to what we should have learned decades ago in Vietnam, getting engaged yes. in these things where mission creep comes into play, Afghanistan, Iraq, Looks like it's reeling all over again. Big difference is this is where two world wars were started. Much different setting, much different context. We're going to make sure that we get to the bottom of it. It's supposed to give us an answer by May 2nd. What's so distressing when you hear that is you're not a talk show host on a cable news channel. You're a sitting United States senator who was elected by your entire state. And one of your jobs is to provide oversight of the Pentagon. And if they held that information from you, they hid it from you, I mean, that seems like a very big deal. It's a big deal, and it's not the first time. Look at how many other times within agencies in the Biden administration. Look how they've used executive orders when they bypass the legislative process. This is clear. If you're going to deploy troops, that's a congressional responsibility from the 73 Wars Powers Act. There's so much in this administration that they use the agencies, if they can't get it done legislatively, let's yes. just force the issue. Here, I think they've really pushed the envelope. We, we've spent so much time pounding on your Republican colleagues in the Senate for ignoring this stuff, and then we learned that you were, I think, rightly incensed by it. Can you give us a sense of how many of your fellow Republicans in the Senate share your views on this? Let's look at it this way. When I ran, I ran as an outsider, so I look at things differently. And this relates to, like, this budget mess we're in as well. There are at least 10 to 15 neocons. These are the most aggressive of the defense hawks. I think it's the most yes. important thing we do, but I hold defense accountable. This is how this happens. So there are generally, in a really weird way, 10 to 15 Republicans that team up now with all Democrats to yes. give us the budget mess we've got and then go along with this foreign escapade stuff. We cannot be the police of the world. We pay all the bills over there now. Where's the EU handling its fair share of this? So much is wrong. We just have to be careful here. You know, from the outside, that's exactly what it looks like. But it's, it's really interesting to hear that confirmed from the inside. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, 
and God raised him from the dead. See, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.